Hi everyone at the Junyi Education Foundation, Sal Khan here from Khan Academy, and I'm excited to participate in your conference, at least via video. Uh, and I'm here to answer uh, questions. And so uh, y'all have sent me some questions, so I'll just take them one by one. So this first question is, why does AI tutoring have the potential to revolutionize human education? In your observation, do you foresee any groundbreaking growth in this field by 2030? So to take those uh, questions in reverse order, yes, I, I definitely think you're going to see groundbreaking uh, innovation by 2030 and probably a lot sooner than that. And the reason why I think AI in education or everyone being able to have an AI tutor is a big deal is because tutoring is a big deal. If you were to go back 2000 years, uh, very few people got an education, but those that did got a very good one. If you were a uh, the son of a king or a prince, uh, you are likely, your education probably involved at least one or maybe several tutors who would work with you. And if you found something easy, you would move on to the next concept so that you're never bored. And if you found something difficult, your tutors would probably slow down and make sure you understand that. Uh, we can think of Alexander the Great, who had Aristotle as his personal tutor. And I'm sure that Aristotle, if, Al if young Alexander uh, was having trouble with military strategy or taxation, that Aristotle would spend a little bit more time because he was tutoring the future emperor. You fast forward to about 300 years ago, and society had a very utopian idea, and that's the idea of mass free public education, which has been a very, very good idea, but we had to make compromises in order to do that. First of all, you couldn't offer to give everyone a one-on-one -on -one tutor. Instead, we borrowed ideas from the Industrial Revolution, ideas like batching stu students together by age, moving them all together at a set pace, applying some processes to them, like lectures, like assessments, and when that test comes around, when that quiz comes around, some students might get a 100%, others might get an 80%, other students might get a 70%. And even though that that assessment identified gaps in students' understanding, the whole class then moves on to the next concept. Essentially, you can think of an assembly line that just keeps going and going and going. And the end result of that is that those gaps keep accumulating with students. And we see that happening with so many students having difficulty, especially in subjects like math, where how can you hope to understand algebra if you have a 20% gap in decimals and you have a 30% gap in exponents uh, and you have a 10% gap in negative numbers, and now all of a sudden in algebra, you're expected to have fluency in it. Same thing, how can you hope to understand calculus if you don't have 100% mastery or proficiency of algebra and everything that, that came before it? And so all of us at Khan Academy, many of y'all know, I started down this journey as a tutor. I, I, my day job, I was in tech, and then I worked as an analyst at a hedge fund, but my cousins needed help. I started tutoring them remotely, and it was working. By giving them that personal attention, allowing them to fill in any gaps they had, uh, they were able to go uh, from, in many cases, normal students, or even sometimes students who are struggling, into advanced students. And so to a large degree, everything that we've been doing at Khan Academy over the last, it's been almost 19 years since I started tutoring my cousins. It's been over 12, 13 years since we've been doing Khan Academy properly as an organization. We've been trying to look at how can we leverage technology to at least approximate what a good tutor would do, what I was doing for my cousins, what Aristotle did for Alexander the Great. And so for the last decade plus, we've been doing things like personalized mastery learning, which is students can get videos if they need help. They can get exercises to learn at their own time and pace, get immediate feedback that if they have a tutor or a parent or a teacher, we can then give data to them so that they can provide more personalization. But the idea is if a student's ready to move on, they should be able to move on. If a student needs to spend more time on something, if they're at a 70 or 80%, they should be able to have that opportunity incentive to get that more practice and to fill in those gaps. But What's exciting about generative AI is that takes it to a whole other level. That yes, we can provide that those exercises, we can provide those videos. Uh, some cases students have a really amazing teachers and parents there, but generative AI allows to fill that gap. So if a student has a question about anything, they're watching a video, they're doing an exercise, it can support them. And not in a way where it just gives them the answer. I know there's been a lot of talk about chat GPT just giving folks answers. But Conmigo, which is the generative AI that we have on Khan Academy, it won't give you the answers, but it will have a Socratic dialogue about it. And it will give you leading questions so that it would do what I was doing with my cousins uh, nearly, nearly 19 years ago. And so intuitively, we think this is an opportunity to have mass free or close to free public education. 
um, either going through the school system or even just families and students coming on their own to a resource like Khan Academy. Uh, but doing it in a way where we don't have to make that the same type of compromise we did when we during the Industrial Revolution, where you have to batch students 30 together. They're still batched, but now they can get that personalization, even if it's a, a 30 to 1 student teacher ratio. And this just doesn't even intuitively make sense. There's tons of research over the last 50 plus years that tutoring really is the gold standard. Tutoring really is something that can take an average student or below average student and make them an excellent student. The only reason why we haven't implemented it in the school system is it's logistically difficult and it's very resource intensive. And so that's where I think generative AI, Conmigo, can play a very, very, very big role. I will make it very clear though, I do, not, I do not view this as somehow being a replacement for the teacher. What it does do, it, it can act as a tutor for the students and it acts as a teaching assistant for the teacher. So it saves the teacher time so that they also have more time and energy to be there with the students. So if they can get help doing things like lesson planning, they can get reports back on what the AI is doing with the students. They could get help uh, with things, even preliminary passes on grading or progress reports. Teachers now have more time and energy for that uniquely human connection. So I could go on, I'm writing a book about it as we speak, uh, but I think this is a very, very, very big deal. And when you think about 2030, I think you're going to have very rich, full AI tutors that you can talk to. You might even eventually put virtual reality headset on, be in the same space with them. But at worst case, you're going to be able to video conference with them. Um, they're going to feel very natural. They're going to have a sense of memory. We're already working on this. So it's not just that one conversation, but it's a long-term conversation and relationship that you can have with the AI tutor. And it's not going to be just passively there waiting for you to ask it questions. It's going to be texting you and saying, hey, <laughs> you said you were going to meet me. Where are you? It's going to be saying, hey, you said you were going to achieve this much or you said you were going to study this many hours. It looks like you didn't do it. Let's talk about what's going on in your life. And these are the types of things that I was doing with my cousins. And I think any really strong uh, tutor would need to do. But I think this is going to be a reality, not by uh, 2030, probably in the next five years. So, you know, well, I guess that gets us to about 2028. So, yeah, roughly in the in the, the 2030 time frame. So the next question why have both Biden and Bill Gates sought discussions with you? I can guess. <laughs> you could ask them. <laughs> um, well, you know, Bill Gates has been a, a huge thought partner uh, with Khan Academy from the get-go. Many of y'all might know that back in 2010, when I was just starting, it, it, I had quit my day job. I was working on Khan Academy full-time as a not-for-profit. It just came out. Uh, Bill Gates was speaking at a conference. Someone asked him what he's excited about. And he says, well, yeah, there's a site called Khan Academy. I'm using it myself. I'm using it with my children. And so he's been both a user of Khan Academy. Um, and then the Gates Foundation has been a significant supporter of Khan Academy over, over the last 10, 10 plus years. What I think has been especially interesting over this last year, uh, OpenAI reached out to us about a year ago. Uh, and showed us GPT-4. This is well before ChatGPT existed, and many of y'all know ChatGPT isn't, the one that most people are familiar with is not based on GPT-4, it's based on GPT-3.5. So when we saw what GPT-4 was uh, capable of doing, we were under a non-disclosure agreement at the time with OpenAI, but Microsoft was also um, uh, uh, read in. And so I remember it was in October or November of 2022, um, Bill Gates had also uh, seen what they were doing. And when we met and I was explaining to him that I think this is a game changer for tutoring and that Khan Academy, we really want to go all in on this because we really think this can level the playing field. I think between that and um, his already deep interest in generative AI, he's the person that put the challenge out to open AI saying, hey, GPT-3 is cute. It's nice, but it's really bad at knowledge. I want to see if your next model can pass the AP biology exam. And the AP biology exam is kind of a college, first year college level exam. And that's honestly one of the reasons why OpenAI reached out to us because we have a lot of AP biology content. But they also saw that GPT-4 was going to be such a powerful model uh, that it was both going to be exciting and scary for folks. And they wanted to make sure that they launched with some, what they view social positive use cases from organizations that people trust. And uh, Khan Academy, this is their words, were, were the first folks they reached out to. The Biden administration, uh, when they were, and you know, they continue to figure out what is the role of AI in society, what's the degree to which it needs to be regulated or not. Uh, the Office of Science and Technology Policy, when they invited me to this um, group with Biden, they said, look, the reason why we want you there is there's so much fear and anxiety around uh, generative AI. 
And there's also a lot of positivity, but Khan Academy's Conmigo use case is really the most tangible, positive use case of generative AI that people can think of right now. Um, and so I, I, I'm getting invited to a lot of these things to show that, yes, there are things to think about. There are things around security and privacy uh, and making sure that it's used well. Uh, but this notion of being able to use it to improve human intelligence, to improve uh, human potential through tutoring, through education. Uh, and not that, it, you know, it's not, we're just not talking about it. We're building it. We have tens of thousands of students already in real schools starting to use Conmigo as part of their everyday learning. And I suspect in the coming years, it's going to be hundreds of thousands and millions using generative AI. And so I think that's the reason why uh, a lot of folks are indexing on us is that we are not just talking about what could be, but we're building something that's already there and it is the most tangible use case, hopefully a positive use case of, of what's going on. That if you put the right guardrails, all of our interactions are monitored. We have a second AI that sends messages to parents and teacher or, uh, parents and teachers if something shady is going on with the AI. We're not using the student data to train off of. Uh, we hide the personally identifiable information from the AI. And of course, we're not using it. Uh, we don't allow it f to cheat for students, um, I think is what, what has folks getting excited that we're, we're, we're hopefully thinking about it in, in the right way. See, the next question, how did Khan Academy collaborate with partners to create Conmigo? Well, I chatted about it a little bit. OpenAI reached out to us uh, about a year ago. We started playing around with it. The tutor use case was immediately front of mind for us. And uh, we started doing some rapid prototyping with OpenAI uh, in, in last fall of 2022. And then by, you know, then uh, by December, January, and remember, this was with GPT-4, not with ChatGPT. Uh, you know, and I don't think ChatGPT, it's an interesting tool, but GPT-3.5 is not sufficient. And we've done a lot of testing to do real tutoring. So it doesn't give the answer, the math and the hallucinations and all of those AI issues are need to get under control. And there's been a lot of work we've done on top of that uh, to mitigate those things on, on Khan Academy. And so that's been primarily in partnership um, with OpenAI, but we're talking to other folks as well. We're talking to folks like Google uh, about ways that we might be able to leverage some of the models that they're working on as well. So our goal is to just use the best technology out there uh, we have a engineering team that I think we could go head to head with any engineering team on the planet um, to really show how this very exciting technology can be used for true social good and true human empowerment. As a not-for-profit organization, how does Khan Academy ensure the equitable and sustainable development of educational AI projects like Conmigo, including its financial aspects? It's a good question. Uh, even before generative AI, our mission is free world-class education for anyone anywhere but it still costs money to build Khan Academy. We spend about 60 to $70 million per year. It, it's a lot of money, but I point out to folks, it's about the budget of one large high school in the United States, and we reach over 100 million of folks a year, and I hope in the next few years we're talking about we're reaching billions of folks. We're in 50 languages, 50 plus localization projects. There's 50, the 50 seems like a magical number. There's 50 plus efficacy studies around Khan Academy showing how it really meaningfully can accelerate students if they're putting at least 30 to 60 minutes a week uh, on this platform. So we've primarily funded that 60 to 70 million with philanthropic support. Uh, we have a few small sources of, of earned revenue when we work with school districts and things like that. Uh, but and, and the marginal cost for just classic Khan Academy, we do spend about five or six million of that 60 to 70 million on server costs. But that's for 100 million plus folks. So the marginal cost per person is it's in the pennies. Uh, what's interesting about generative AI, it's much more computationally intensive. And so hopefully the costs come down. But right now, the marginal cost per user per month depending how you account for it, five, 10, $15 per user per month, especially when you're thinking about these more sophisticated models like GPT-4. So we're trying to navigate that right now, this first wave of pilots. We are telling the, the partner school districts that look, we at least have to cover the cost of the computation, otherwise Khan Academy is going to go bankrupt. Uh, so we are, uh, we are charging for that. Uh, but once again, we are trying to emphasize working with large urban school districts that have a large number of kids in poverty. They are not the kids paying for the use. It's coming through their district resources. We do think in a lot of these school districts that are paying, that are spending in many cases, tens of thousands of dollars per student per year in a world where even with the generative AI costs being on the order of 30, 40, $50 per year, if it can accelerate by also helping the students engage better with that Khan Academy work, 
between the generative AI and the Khan Academy, if they, these students can accelerate 20, 30, 40%, that is worth it. I think it's a very strong argument. But with that said, as the costs of generative AI come down, and hopefully in a year or two, we're talking about a factor of 10 decrease, we're going to make it that much more accessible. But in the near term, it'll come through district money, government money, philanthropic money to be able to support that. And then in the long run, well, it'll continue to be those, those sources of, of revenue, uh, but we hope to bring the cost down as much as possible. Because once again, our mission, free world-class education for anyone, anywhere. So we need to sustain ourselves as an organization, be able to do the R&D, pay for the computation costs. Uh, but we're not looking uh, to obviously, um, you know, no one owns Khan Academy. Uh, all, of, all of those resources are really just to continue to make ourselves uh, better and better. And we want to make it as accessible as possible, hopefully one day free or close to free. Uh, obviously, core Khan Academy is free. Um, already, so um, we, 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 we hope to eventually get there. Let's see, uh, how does Khan Academy interact with and iterate upon real world educators and students uh, validating the efficacy? Um, there's a ton of ways, as I met, just mentioned, we have 50 plus efficacy studies on Khan Academy. Uh, the most recent, I mean, there's almost two or three uh, major studies coming out every year and then a bunch of other ones. Uh, we're, I think we are the most studied platform because we are just so open and transparent with uh, what we're doing. But uh, the, 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 even before generative AI, what we are seeing is when students are able to put 30 to 60 minutes a week or on an annual basis, about 18 hours over the course of the year, which actually isn't that much when you really think about it. Students, depending on the study, the most recent studies have shown some of these were during the COVID pandemic. Students uh, were accelerated, like our, the eighth graders in the study accelerated 40% more than pre-pandemic norms. And that's in a situation where the baseline of eighth graders during the pandemic in that group had actually declined 15%. So if you compared the group that had hit those usage thresholds, like 18 hours, to those that, did, that, that weren't using Khan Academy, you were actually looking at 60, 70, 80% acceleration. The average student in the US gets about 0.7 grade levels per year. When the students get to 18 hours of using Khan Academy, they're getting more like 1.1, 1.2 grade levels a year. And that's the difference between when you're 18 years old, you're still trying to learn pre-algebra versus when you're 18 years old, you already have learned calculus and you're ready to you're ready to take on a lot more. So it makes a huge difference. And obviously this isn't just in the US. Many of these efficacy studies um, have increasingly been done um, international. Uh, so obviously our goal isn't just to be used, it's just to make sure that that usage that is happening is actually effective. Uh, um, and some people say, well, maybe it's just the motivated students who are getting to that level of dosage. But the most, one of the most recent studies we saw, we were able, it was a two-year study where we were able to compare students to themselves. So some students use it more in year two than year one. Some students use it less in year two than year one. And so that helped us understand the same student who arguably has the same level of motivation, when they used it more, every hour led to, a st led to an acceleration. Every hour that they use it less led it to led to a deceleration of their learning. So that one we, we found was was pretty compelling. Uh, but we're con continuing to research this, and we're working with real school districts. Uh, half of our usage is international, half is North America. Half of our usage is in classrooms. This is teachers getting their kids to use Khan Academy. Half is outside of classrooms, and in that classroom use case, a lot of our user research. We're always embedding ourselves in ca our classrooms. There are about a million students in school districts that are formal partners of Khan Academy. Obviously, we're talking about tens of millions who use us on a regular basis, but a million who are formal uh, partners of Khan Academy where we're doing support and training, et cetera. And that's where we're running most of the efficacy studies. So we're trying to get as much in feedback and input as we can. And we're doing the same thing with generative AI. As I mentioned, Conmigo is not a theoretical thing. We launched as part of the GPT-4 launch back in March of 2023 immediately several tens of thousands of students started using them in real school districts and now in this school year uh, we're only seeing that accelerate so thanks for having me uh those good good questions uh and uh I, I look forward to continuing our conversation thanks thanks everyone